In which case, even if the design argument does prove the existence of a creator, it's spectacularly uninformative about his attributes. To take another example, traditional theology is monotheistic. However, most complicated large-scale human projects are achieved as a result of teams of designers and builders working together. If we make strict use of the analogy when trying to explain the creation of the universe, then we'll have to take seriously the suggestion that the universe was created by a team of gods. Alternative explanations. Philo also suggests several alternative explanations of the apparent order and design in the world. Some of these are deliberately far-fetched. His point is that if we scrutinise the evidence provided by the design argument, it can't rule out these alternatives. There is at least as much evidence for them as there is that the Christian God is the source of order and design in the universe. For instance, at one point Philo gets very close to suggesting a theory of evolution on the lines of natural selection. He conjectures that apparent design could have arisen from the fact that those animals not well adapted to the environment in which they find themselves simply die. Thus we should not be surprised to find animals well adapted to their surroundings. Another explanation that Philo toys with is that of a gigantic spider spinning the universe from its abdomen. His point is that order and apparent design don't necessarily stem from an intelligent brain. Spiders spin webs with order and design, yet they spin from their abdomens. The analogy between a spider and a creator of the universe may seem absurd, Philo agrees, but if there were a planet inhabited solely by spiders, then it would seem the most natural explanation of order, as natural as it seems to us that all apparent design stems from human-like thought. Evil. The most destructive criticism of the design argument is provided by the problem of evil. How could a benevolent god have designed a world in which there is so much suffering? Philo paints a picture of human life beset with pain. Cleanthes' response is that such pain might be the lesser of two evils. His claim is that the reason God designed a world with so much potential for pain and suffering built into it was that any alternative world would have been even worse. But as Philo insists, an omnipotent God could have created a better world. Or at least that's how it seems to mere mortals. Philo identifies four principal causes of suffering – none of which seem necessary, but all of which are part of the human condition. First, we are so constituted that pain, as well as pleasure, is in some cases needed to stir us into action. We seem to have been designed so that, for instance, the discomfort of extreme thirst gives us a strong incentive to find some water, whereas Philo thinks we could have been driven purely by the desire for pleasure of varying degrees. Second, the world, including the human world, strictly follows what he calls general laws. These are the laws of physics. A direct result of this is that all sorts of calamities occur, earthquakes and so on. Yet surely a good and omnipotent God could intervene to stop such events. A few minor adjustments would have produced a much better world with far less suffering in it. But God chose not to intervene. Third, nature equips us with the bare minimum that we need to survive. This makes us vulnerable to the slightest fluctuation in our circumstances. Philo suggests that a benevolent parent like God would have provided more generously for us in such things as food and natural strength. Fourth, Philo points to the bad workmanship evident in the design of the universe, at least when it is seen from a human perspective. Thus we find that although rain is necessary to help plants grow and to give us something to drink, it frequently rains so hard that flooding results. This and many other design faults lead Philo to the conclusion that the creator of the universe must have been indifferent to human suffering. Certainly the design argument doesn't provide sufficient evidence to warrant a belief in a benevolent creator, anything but. The first cause argument. Although most of the discussion in the dialogues focuses on the design argument, this is not the only alleged proof of God's existence and nature that's brought up. Timaea is an ardent defender of what he calls the simple and sublime argument a priori better known as the cosmological or first cause argument. This is the argument which begins with the assumption that anything that exists must have had a prior cause which explains its existence. If we trace the chain of effects and causes back in time, we must either keep on going back in what is known as an infinite regress, or else we will find an uncaused cause, one that necessarily exists. De Meyer thinks that the first option, an infinite regress, is absurd, and so concludes 
that the necessarily existing uncaused cause is the first cause of everything and is God. Cleanthes' response includes the argument that if we're looking for a first cause of everything, we needn't go back further than to the universe itself. There's no need to postulate a cause preceding that. Or to put it another way, even if the first cause argument proves that there is a first cause, it doesn't prove that that cause is God, certainly not as traditionally conceived by Christians. Was Hume an atheist? I've already mentioned the difficulty of unravelling precisely what Hume believed about religion on the basis of the dialogues. Philo, despite being the character closest intellectually to Hume, isn't simply a mouthpiece for that philosopher. Many of Hume's contemporaries took it for granted that he was an atheist, and no doubt if the dialogues had been published during his lifetime, it would have been treated as conclusive proof of this. However, it's interesting that Hume was genuinely shocked when he met unashamed atheists in Paris in the 1760s, though his views might have changed by the end of his life. His official doctrine was mitigated scepticism, a moderate form of scepticism which takes nothing on trust but doesn't go to the absurdities of those sceptics who attempt to live as if nothing whatsoever could be taken for granted. Mitigated scepticism, applied to questions of religion, points in the direction of atheism but stop short of it. The mitigated sceptic wouldn't accept the design argument as proof of the Christian God's existence or attributes. But saying that there is insufficient reason on which to base a belief in God's existence is not the same as asserting that God definitely does not exist. You might well have considered atheism a dogmatic position, that is, one for which there is insufficient evidence. Perhaps, then, Hume really did believe, along with Philo, that the universe had some kind of intelligent creator. However, he certainly believed that human reason was insufficient to give us detailed knowledge of what that creator, if there was one, might be like. And Hume died without holding out any hope for an afterlife.